so it's really my, uh, my honor and a real pleasure to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, Joe Takahashi. Um, Joe and I were graduate students together in the same lab 40 years ago. <laughs> and this is the first time I've introduced him. <laughs> so finally there's something to say. <laughs> so Joe is currently the Lloyd B. Sands Distinguished Chair in Neuroscience investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and chair of the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Texas Southwest Medical Center in Dallas. He received his PhD in neuroscience from the University of Oregon and did postdoctoral training as a pharmacology research associate at the National Institute of Mental Health. Joe then began a 26-year career at Northwestern University where he rose to the ranks to become the Walter and Mary Elizabeth Glass Professor in the Life Sciences. He was also appointed professor of neurology at the medical school and was director of the Center for Functional Genomics. He also held a number of administrative positions, such as associate director of Northwestern's Institute for Neuroscience. He moved to his current position in 2009. I don't want to take too much of his time, um, thus it is impossible to adequately convey his impact on the field of circadian rhythms and behavioral genetics, and the extended impact on, um, on the health areas affected by those two fields. Many of the landmark discoveries, certainly the most from any one lab, that propelled the field of circadian rhythms forward over the last three decades have come from Joe's lab especially the discoveries responsible for our fundamental understanding of the cellular and molecular basis of circadian regulation in mammals. This includes, of course, the discovery and characterization of the first mammalian clock gene, appropriately called clock. This remarkable record is captured in nearly 300 uh, publications. I, I tried to count the number of science and nature papers, and it's just uh, too many. Okay, so Joe has received too many honors to recite all of them. Recognition of his contributions, however, began very early when he won the Hanma International Prize in Biological Rhythms in 1986. And just a sample of other honors to illustrate the breadth of his impact, he received W. Alden Spencer Award in Neuroscience from Columbia University in 2001, the Edward Buechner Prize from the German Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in 2003, Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award from the Sleep Research Society in 2012, and just this year the Gruber Neuroscience Prize from the Gruber um, Foundation. In 2014, he was selected as a Thomson Reuters highly cited researcher in biology and biochemistry. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2000, a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 2003, and a member of the National Academy of Medicine in 2014. All this, Joe has provided remarkable service to our community through work on numerous advisory boards and committees for the NIH and many other institutions and foundations. He has organized many conferences, and contributed to several societies, including serving as president of the Society for Biological Rhythms. On top of all this, he found time to co-found uh, two biotech companies. So, um, so please join me in um, welcoming <coughs> Joe.
inch. <laughs> so as all of you know, we live on a planet that has a 24-hour uh, environmental cycle, light and dark. And one way to think about this cycle is that it's an energetic cycle. So if you're a plant, this would be obvious. You photosynthesize in the day, you fix nitrogen at night, and you're living off the solar energy. Uh, in animals and other complex organisms, uh, they also go through an energetic cycle every day. Uh, so for us, it's sleep weight, activity, but we also go through a nutritional cycle every day, eating and fasting, typically. Uh, and organisms uh, throughout uh, biology have really evolved to uh, create molecular clocks that anticipate these environmental changes. And the conserved motif in essentially all these organisms is that it's a negative transcriptional feedback loop. It takes 24 hours to progress. Uh, now, we always point to this paper as the beginning of the modern era of the circadian, uh, of circadian rhythms. And this is a paper by Ron Knopf and Seymour Benzer uh, at Caltech. This is a more recent picture of Ron taken in 2000, but Ron was a graduate student with Seymour, and he uh, undertook a genetic screen in flies at the behavioral uh, and developmental level, and found three mutants that affect the periodicity of flies. One shortened the period to about 18 or 19 hours, another lengthened it to about 28 hours, and one abolished the rhythm. Uh, incredibly, they all map to a single locus on the X chromosome that they named the period locus. Okay. Now, it took many more years to actually identify the gene that was done later, as I'll mention in a moment, uh, in 1984-85. Uh, and <clears throat> during this time, once that first period gene was cloned, all of us tried to find mammalian homologs of period by sequence homology, PCR, all sorts of methods. Um, but uh, we all failed for 13 years again uh, to achieve that. So in the meantime, my, my lab had sort of hit a brick wall, and we decided the only way that we could find genes in mammals was to do what Ron and Seymour did. And that was to step one, one, take one step back and actually do a phenotypic screen. But instead of doing it in flies, we uh, chose to do mutagenesis in the mouse. And uh, we were very lucky. Uh, we had a colleague, Bill Dove, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who was using ENU mutagenesis to screen for mutants and enzymes. And so we uh, teamed up with Bill, uh, and he screened for his enzyme, and then <coughs> those uh, negative mice he shipped down to Evanston, uh, and then we tested them behaviorally uh, with our running wheel assay. So this is a uh, actogram of a normal mouse. It's uh, a raster plot. It's double plotted, so you can see the pattern better. And each line is a day, and it's a 50 plus day experiment. <coughs> And for the first two weeks, the mouse is in, in a constant, uh, in a light-dark cycle. It runs at night. And then here, it's released into darkness. Uh, and it shows its own endogenous periodicity, which is, in this case, 23.7 hours. It wakes up a little earlier each day. So in this screen, Martha D. Turner, the postdoc in my lab, found this incredible clock mutant mouse shown here. It can still synchronize the light, but when it's released into darkness, it has a 28-hour clock. It wakes up four hours later each day. And then, gradually, the rhythm damps out and disappears. Okay. So this mouse uh, allowed us to then find the gene using positional cloning. Now, we knew at the time it was on mouse chromosome 5. Uh, and today, of course, if you look at your computer, mouse genome sequence, uh, but back in the 90s, of course, there was no genome sequence uh, for mouse or human. Uh, and so uh, we, we and others had to undertake uh, a method called positional cloning. And so my lab at the time, in the 90s, uh, had to work together as a team of 10 people 
working for three years to do all of the projects, high resolution genetic mapping, physical mapping of the entire region that's going to be down there, and then finally identifying all the genes in the region uh, by various methods we had to use back then. Um, <coughs> so today I'd like to call positional cloning the geneticist GPS system, genome positioning system. We use markers in the genome to hone in and infer where we think the location of that human gene might be. So that 30 person year effort really was worth it because the product of that gene discovery was a very interesting predicted protein which uh, we named CLOCK uh, and it became obvious from its uh, amino acid sequence that it was likely a transcription factor because it had a BHLH region and a glutamine rich C terminus. Uh, and the following year with Chuck White down the street here, we uh, used these two hybrids to find the partner clock, which turned out to be another protein called DMAL1. And these two proteins, both BHLH pass proteins, uh, work as a heterodimer. Uh, and more recently, we uh, were able to solve the crystal structure of BHLH pass ID at Southwestern. One of my fantasies at Northwestern. Um, now, we now know that CLOG and DMAL are upstream regulators of two sets of repressor proteins, the original period homologs, PER1 and PER2, or paralogs, or orthologs, I should say, uh, and then two cryptochrome proteins, uh, which were originally discovered in plants as blue light photoreceptors, but in mammals are not photo sensitive and act as transcriptional repressor proteins. So these genes are activated the day the RNAs accumulate, proteins accumulate, they interact with each other and with another kinase, casein kinase 1, epsilon, and delta. Then they translocate back into the nucleus where they repress their own transcription. So this feedback loop takes about 24 hours to progress. Uh, and these six genes, I would say, are essential. Um, there, there are other genes, as I'll show you in a moment. Now, one of the important <coughs> historical events that occurred uh, was in the 90s. Uh, Gene Block, now the chancellor of UCLA, uh, was able to obtain an NSF Science and Technology Center uh, to study biological timing. <coughs> And very early on, uh, we were directed to uh, do something that individual labs couldn't do. And so, uh, one of the projects we came up with is what I call the Clock Genome Project, which I directed. Uh, there are three of us. Uh, there's the University of Virginia, Northwestern, and Rockefeller, initially involved in the center. And the idea here is we would uh, undertake genetic screens in three model organisms. A Rapidopsis, which was just constructed by Steve Kay, who newly arrived at UVA, uh, Drosophila, and Mouse at Northwestern. And initially we had Mike Young at Rockefeller, and then later on we recruited Jeff Hall and Michael Rosbash from Brandeis to corner the market on flies, because they were the three major fly labs at the time. <clears throat> and this center was really uh, remarkable, because for my lab, it actually allowed us to find a gene because we could not get supported by NIH to uh, do positional cloning at that time. They didn't really believe in uh, for genetics in the mouse. Didn't happen until about 2000 that NIH started supporting this kind of work <coughs> after the fact. Um, but all of the major fly genes that were discovered after a period in timeless came from mutant screens that were conducted in this center. Double time, virile number, and and clock and cycle. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so this was an incredibly important and exciting time for us, and I think uh, made a monumental contribution to the field. Really allowed the field to coalesce around uh, this problem of gene identification uh, and putting the pathway together. Now, of course. Uh, in 2017, uh, 
the three fly labs uh, were to receive the Nobel Prize um, in physiology and medicine for the cloning of the period gene, which of course has helped our field immensely. Now going back uh, to what I call the core loop here, uh, one of the things that came from gene cloning that was surprising at the time is that the genes are ubiquitous. We used to think they were only in the right. But once we clone the genes, we found they're in many tissues. And this is one example. This is a fibroblast culture um, where each of these uh, little twinkling stars is an individual fibroblast that's cycling with per 2 lock bioluminescence. And so here are just two example cells from this experiment, which was run for 18 days. So the single cell oscillator is just incredibly robust. Uh, in fibroblasts. This sort of led to the idea in the field that there are really clocks throughout the body, not just in the brain, and every major organ system has a clock that's driven by the cell atomic site of the clock. So uh, what are clocks or clock genes doing in the periphery? So here's one, one example done by, by my colleague Joe Bass at Northwestern, where we knew in the clock view mouse uh, there was a defect in uh, many metabolic pathways, including glucose regulation. So we asked if you knock out female only in pancreatic islets, uh, will there be a phenotype? And the answer is yes. So um, deletion of female one only in pancreatic islets leads to a loss in glucose regulation. And this is due to insufficient insulin production. Uh, Joe Bass has shown, gone on to show that uh, the defect is really in insulin secretory pathways that are regulated by clock and female. Uh, and so clock genes, at least, are doing something very important uh, in a peripheral tissue. And here's another example from Michael Metker's lab, University of Virginia, my uh, PhD advisor. Uh, where they <coughs> showed that the ovary, in this case of a rat, has a beautiful circadian rhythm that you can measure with per one lucid rays. Okay, so these are, um, this is the, the circadian rhythm of the ovary in culture, explant cultures. Uh, and they could, uh, so this is a phase plot. You can see that all the ovaries clustered phase, uh, and in this particular experiment, they sectioned the nerve to the ovary and showed it had no effect on phase, and whether the ovary could reset to a shifted light cycle, either advancing or delaying by six hours. So these are phase plots showing the resets after six days. Okay. Um, now, <coughs> Mike Sellex in Michael Manager's lab did an interesting experiment shown here where uh, they cultured ovaries, but they inhibited to induce uh, um, LH secretion, and then they induced ovulation or in, in, uh, in culture with LH. And what they found is uh, a daily rhythm and sensitivity to induction, even though and it wasn't regulated by the ester cycle. So they did it through the ester cycle, which of course is about four or five days of the rat. But what they found is there was a daily rhythm and sensitivity independent of what the phase of the ester cycle was when they unmasked it in this way. So they argued that the, that the um, ovary has a clock that is gating uh, ovulation in a circadian manner, uh, different from the classic model of ovulation, where the timing is thought to come only from the SEN and to go through um, the pituitary ovary and the ovulation. So instead, uh, the Medicare lab argues that at all levels of this axis, 
there are circadian oscillators. Of course, there's a clock in SCN, but also in ENRH neurons. I was shown by Ted Nolley's lab, the pituitary, which many people have shown, and then finally the ovary, as Medica's lab show, showed recently. Um, so there is a direct connection um, <coughs> between uh, clocks and eggs. Okay, so let's go back to this core mechanism. Um, the clock G network is a little more complicated than that 613 <coughs> diagram I just showed. So here I've put in a little more detail uh, because the two PERS and the two cryptochromes are regulated slightly differently. Uh, we do think in essentially all tissues, the input signals to the molecular clock come in through PER1 and PER2, through classic pathways. Um, and we think that most outputs really are transcriptional uh, from this molecular clock. Um, but interestingly, uh, clock and BMAL regulate two other transcriptional loops. Uh, one is a loop um, governed by the nuclear receptor reverb alpha, shown here. This was discovered by Uli Schiller's lab in 2002. And a third loop, which regulates another transcription factor, DBP, also discovered in Uli Schiller's lab. Uh, and these three loops are interlocked, but what's common is they're all driven by clock female. Okay, they all depend on clock female. The core loop can run independently of the other two loops, but the other two loops strongly influence the core loop. So one reason they do this is the reverb uh, loop here regulates BMAL and clock transcription in a rhythm. Through ROR activation. And then the DBP loop um, is regulated by another transcription factor called NFIL3, important in T cell development in the immune system, uh, which suppresses uh, DBP, which is a parasitic transcription factor. Um, and this uh, D element uh, transcriptional regulatory uh, factor is important in period regulation. So one of the ways this is manifest is if you look at the timing of gene expression, uh, you can see a very wide range in peaks of these genes. Uh, and we think this arises from a combinatorial activation of these three transcriptional loops. So DDP here shown in light blue peaks at eight, and it's almost a pure clock female regulated gene. PER2 shown in yellow, uh, it comes later and it's dominated by E-box, or clock female, and the D-box. Uh, and then CRY1, shown in red, comes even later, and it appears to be a combination of uh, E-box and RR, the, or, uh, the uh, second loop transcription factor. And then finally, BMAL, shown in dark blue here, is uh, dominated by the second loop. So these three loops um, not only are interconnected, but they also have their own gene targets uh, and regulate many pathways, especially the reverbs, which have been known to regulate many metabolic pathways, specifically lipid uh, biosynthesis. Okay, so a number of years ago with the advent of uh, chip seek technology, we were then able to look and search for target genes for the clock transcriptional uh, elements. And so here is a chip seek profile for BMAL1 occupancy of the DVP gene. So here's a, a site of the promoter, intron 1, intron 2. And then these samples are taken from mouse liver are time samples taken at six different times a day, where zero is CT0 or dawn. And mouse is in darkness, which is why we use the CT convention. And zero to 12 is daytime, or subjective day, and 12 to 24 would be subjective night. And then KO is a female knockout, which is a, a control for specificity. Okay. So occupancy 
see a bee mouth cycling every day. It's high in the daytime, low at night. And if we look, then look at the core loop with all six core factors, clock and bee mouth are on in the daytime. And then the repressors, PER1, PER2, and PRI2 come on at night between 12 and 20. And then PRI1 comes on even later. C220 peaks at dawn and then goes away. So the entire uh, feedback loop, the core loop, is uh, regulating gene expression um, by this rhythmic <coughs> DNA occupancy. Yeah. And so if we look at um, their locations in the genome, uh, we find a highly enriched set of genes here in the middle. Uh, and these are the top um, Go categories for those that highly enriched gene set. And you can see the metabolism, of course, at the top in the day. Not surprising for the mouse liver, but you'd see this picture in almost any tissue that you look at today. Metabolism is always a high go category. Okay, so uh, to show you what this means, here's a metabolic chart from K for all pathways. And layered in red are all the female target genes. And so the important message here, I think, is that uh, every metabolic pathway in a cell has direct target genes regulated by clock email. Uh, and so we think this is telling us something very important. The clock is regulating fine-tuning metabolism uh, on a daily basis uh, by transcriptional regulation in a cell autonomous manner. Uh, so, you know, thinking about this, maybe it doesn't make sense to have the clock and SCN have a signal all the way to the liver mobilize the transcription factor network to then regulate all these tap metabolic genes. Uh, why not just do it directly in a cell autonomous way? Uh, and of course, in every cell, the target genes are slightly different. And we're beginning to understand why that is now. Okay. <clears throat> the other surprising feature that we found back then was when we look at uh, chromatin state uh, looking at these histone marks associated with RNA polymerase II transcription, um, one of the striking findings was when we look at histone 3 lysine 4 trimethylation, which is a classic promoter mark, it's highly dynamic. So at 0 and 4 here, uh, it's not there. It comes on, peaks at 12, and then it goes away. So this was very surprising at the time this so-called stable promoter mark came on and off every single day. Uh, and this is a very widespread phenomenon of mouse liver. We found over 5,000 genes where K4 trimethylation is cycling on and off. Uh, as well as these activation marks, uh, lysine 9 acetylation and lysine 27 acetylation. Okay. Uh, so it's as if the chromatin state of the mouse liver is relaxing and contracting each day, sort of making it easier for transcription at one time and less easy at another time, perhaps. Okay. And so this led to the idea that in the mouse liver, there's this incredibly robust transcriptional program that occurs every day. So early in the day, the activators bind. <clears throat> they recruit co-activators such as P300 and CBP. You can see activation marks peaking here, such as lysine 9 acetylation. This is followed by <clears throat> bursts of transcription and HAL2 recruitment and occupancy, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, followed by a repression phase by the PERS and PRIs, which then turn over, and then the cycle starts over. Uh, so the clock is really um, doing a lot more than just regulating the RNA uh, abundance of a set of cycling genes, as we call it. We, we think it's actually mobilizing the whole transcriptional program uh, across much of the genome of the mouse liver. Okay, so um, I'll show you in a moment that PAL2, we think, is <coughs> recruited and initiated in a, in a circadian manner to many of these cycling genes. But we know that PAL2 is also regulated in many other stages, and uh, important in PAL2 regulation is pausing, where initiated PAL2 uh, stops, 
and then there has to be pause, release, and then elongation. So there are at least two or three more steps in Paul II regulation. So we want to look at these and see if they were also under circadian control. And so here's a typical uh, Paul II uh, occupancy profile for a gene. You see a peak of the promoter, that's because of this pausing. And then you see elongation of the gene body, it might slow down for co-transcriptional splicing at exons, and then you see accumulation and termination here. So here I'm going to show you the reverb alpha gene, which is called NR1D1. Okay. And here it's on the minus strand, so it's going from right to left. Uh, and then this is the uh, female occupancy of reverb. So there's sites of the promoter, three intronic enhancers here at first intron, and then two upstream clock enhancers, okay, which are rhythmic. And then this is Paul II occupancy using an antibody that sees all, all versions of Paul II, called Pan Paul II. And what you can see is, and, and this, these cycles are taken over two days, so you see two cycles, 34 hours. Okay. So what you see is that uh, the pausing peak of the promoter is cycling. And its abundance is correlated with uh, recruitment and initiation of Paul II. And then you see this beautiful circadian elongation that happens every, every day. And then you can also see the termination signal here. And then with Paul II, we can actually see four upstream enhancers uh, shown here in the blue boxes. Okay. So um, this is hypophosphorylated Paul II, which is thought to reflect newly recruited to. And what you can see is it's found only at the promoter and the enhancer sites, these seven enhancer sites. Okay? But it's cycling at essentially, well, all of the sites here. Okay? This is the first step in initiation, serine 5 phosphorylation. Again, it's also cycling the promoter, and uh, it, the mark follows elongating Paul 2. Okay? Uh, and then here's uh, serine 7. Phosphorylation is thought to be an elongation mark, so we see this also occurring in the gene body under circadian control. And then finally, the classic serine 2 phosphorylation mark, which you can see uh, at primarily accumulated at the termination site, okay? but also under circadian control. Okay? So, what about pausing? So, here's NELF E chip seek, and this pattern looks just like hypophosphorylated Paul II. Uh, and what's surprising is that it's cycling, but it's positively correlated with Paul II, not negatively correlated, even though it's called negative elongation factor, NELF. Um, now, more, you know, recent work suggests that NELF is actually a positive regulator of transcription, even though it's called a causal factor. Um, and then here's uh, SPT5. Um, subunit of DSIF, another part of the pausing complex. It's also cycling its occupancy, and it elongates with Paul II. So that was the first surprise, that the pausing factors are cycling at these cycling genes. Uh, are there pause genes in the mouse liver? And the answer is yes. So here's the ARC gene, known to neuroscientists. It's a immediate early gene, like FOSS. Uh, and it shows a class pause profile. There's Paul II locked and loaded at the promoter, no circadian modulation, and then NELF and SVT5 are also there. Okay, so there are pause genes. Uh, but we also find an interesting class of gene where the promoter signal is not cycling for either Paul II or NELF or SVT5. Okay. But the elongation is circadian. Uh, and we see a few hundred of this kind of gene in mouse liver. This suggests that um, the circadian uh, recruitment initiation of the promoter can be independent from the elongation, which is, can also be circadian. Okay. So what about um, pausing? So to look at this more carefully, uh, we used ProSeq method, uh, it's an in vitro run-on assay for next-gen sequencing. 
uh, convented in John Lewis's lab at Cornell. Uh, because this method allows us to see the pausing, the proximal promoter pausing signal all to do at nucleotide base resolution. Uh, and so here you can see uh, plus 30 to 60 base pairs downstream from the TSS. You can see this promoter pausing signal for pause polymerase. So here's the uh, revert alpha gene using ProSeq. Because it's on the minus strand, the black histogram down is the plus strand of the gene. And you see it has a beautiful transcription rhythm. Uh, now shown by in vitro transcription. Uh, and you can see these enhancer RNAs at the four enhancer sites uh, that were discovered by TK Kim in Mike Greenberg's lab, also down the street. Um, <clears throat> so, what about the pause signal? So, it turns, so, the surprise is that uh, NELF is actually cycling at thousands of genes in the mouse liver. And its peak phase is actually the same as the BMAL phase. In experiments I'm not showing you, uh, it's tightly recruited and regulated by BMAL at these sites, which is why it's peaking at this phase. Uh, the promoter pausing signal is also under circadian control uh, and also appears to be associated with this BMAL phase. And then finally, we think they contribute to this uh, major steady state mRNA uh, peak in cycle genes of the liver. So, um, to sort of summarize here, every step that we've looked at in PAL2 regulation uh, appears to have circadian regulation, initiation, or recruitment initiation, pausing, uh, and elongation. Uh, but perhaps in different sets of genes, we see each of those features. But what's interesting is the clock is really controlling this basic machine of the cell for transcription at a very, uh, I'd say, intimate level. Okay. All right. So I'd like to um, go on to the last part of my talk, uh, which is a completely <coughs> new area that we've been working on for almost five years now. Uh, and that has to do with the importance of timing of nutrients uh, and caloric restriction in aging and longevity. Uh, and so I've already shown you some uh, features of how the clock gene network is really controlling metabolism. Uh, but it's really embedded within metabolic pathways as well. And so, for example, you know, reverb. Uh, the nuclear receptor is part of the clock gene network, and reverb is a master regulator of many metabolic pathways. So that's clearly embedded within the clock gene network. But the clock gene network also controls many other important pathways, such as NAD synthesis by the enzyme NAMPT, it's an NAD salvage pathway. Uh, NAMPT is a direct target of clock female cycles and leads to a circadian rhythm of NAD in the mouse liver. Uh, and one of the targets of NAD regulation is SIRT1, the deacetylase. Uh, and SIRT1 regulates two of the clock factors, BMAL1 and PER2, uh, which are both acetylated and then deacetylated by SIRT1. Uh, another example of Metabolism influencing the clock is the nutrient sensitive kinase AMPK, uh, who, whose target is cryptochrome in this case. And this can lead to um, targeting of cryptochrome 1 and 2 for ubiquination uh, by D3 ubiquitin ligase complexes uh, to regulate the stability of cryptochrome. So um, the clock regulates metabolism, but Metabolism feeds back onto the clock in various ways, directly, at the molecular level. So this is really the paper that uh, triggered our interest. This is a, uh, an experiment done in Fred Turek's lab back at Northwestern about 10 years ago, where we all know that if you feed a black
complex XML high fat diet, it becomes obese. The model called diet induced obesity, the DIO model. Okay. If you restrict access to that diet to either the daytime or the nighttime, the 12 12 light cycle, so that's either the um, active phase at night or the inactive phase in the daytime, the effect of that diet is completely different. The mice that eat the high fat diet in the daytime gain weight and the mice that eat it at night do not gain as much weight, they're protected. Okay. In this experiment, they're eating the same and their activity level was comparable. So there wasn't any obvious explanation for this difference. Um, so this, this work has been followed up uh, by Sachin Panda's lab. This is a paper a couple years later where he restricted access to the high fat diet to only an eight hour window in the evening uh, as compared to ad lib as shown here in light pink. And of course the ad lib mice become obese and the time restricted mice eating at night are protected from the high fat diet. Um, they're also protected metabolically. Glucose regulation, insulin sensitivity, all are better. Um, and Panda's lab has gone on to look at many different kinds of diets, high carbohydrate, high fat, uh, and all of these so-called bad diets uh, are actually protected by restricting the time of eating to just the nighttime. Um, now surprisingly, uh, when he looked at clock mutant mice, um, these mice still have benefit from time restriction. Uh, but I would say that experiments, you have to qualify that because the mice are on a light cycle. And so they're being driven by the light cycle even though they don't have a clock, functioning clock inside. The light is driving the clock. So, uh, <clears throat> And then finally, in, at NIA, um, Rafael de Cabo's lab has done a short version of feeding. And they can find benefit of that. It's not a strict, strict time restriction where they put on and take off food at the same time. They give a, a meal that is eaten within a short time and they can find a benefit of that. Okay, so uh, why do we get interested in this? Well, of course, in the aging field, caloric restriction is the most uh, effective intervention for extending lifespan. So in Classic experiments done by Richard Weindrick's lab at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, they showed that as you calorically restrict the mouse, progressively the mice live longer and longer. Okay. Uh, and so um, when we looked at these experiments, uh, this protocol down here is the standard protocol for feeding in these longevity experiments. So it says four feedings per week, one daily feeding on Monday and Wednesday, and a double feeding on Friday morning. Okay. So there, there are two problems with this. Mice don't you know, eat three times a week. Uh, they really should be eating every day. And also, they normally don't eat in the morning. They eat most of their food at night, as I'll show you. And so we thought that this, um, could be a complication, and we want to look into uh, whether time is important, uh, not just calories for longevity. Okay? And so our initial experiment was pretty simple. We looked at five groups. Uh, we looked at ad-lib mice here, or two time-restricted groups, what we, that we call TR night. Uh, food is available for 12 hours at night. Or TR day, food is available for 12 hours of the daytime. Or caloric restriction, 30% reduction, where we give the food beginning at the beginning of the night or at the beginning of the day, but the mice have free access to that food for 24 hours. Okay. Now, of course, the reason longevity experiments were done with, the, say, three feedings per week protocol is it takes four years to do that experiment, sometimes longer. Okay? The mice live longer. 
And so your staff is not going to want to feed them uh, every single day of the week for four years. Uh, maybe you could you know, have shifts and stuff like that. Uh, the problem with time restriction is it's double the work. You have to put the food on and take it off every day. Okay. And if you're going to do it properly, you have to do seven days a week for four years. So of course, no one's my, in my lab is going to do that. <coughs> so what we did was we developed an automated feeding system that develops <laughs> pellets, uh, d delivers pellets. So these are 300 milligrams of precision pellets. And we adapted it to our existing running wheel system so we didn't have to expand our you know, cages. Uh, we, we sort of layered them and we fit it into our running wheel boxes. And so this allows us to measure running wheel activity and uh, feeding in an automated way at the same time under controlled conditions for, for a very long time. Okay? Um, so here's an actogram of a mouse on a light dark cycle. It's an ad lib fed mouse. The black is when it's running on the wheel. And then the red dots or pink dots are when it's taking the pellet. So these mice eat 14 pellets a day. And a typical ad lib mouse eats three quarters of that food in the nighttime and one quarter in the daytime. You can see it sort of snacks in the daytime. Okay. So that's, this is typical behavior. Uh, so here are the time restriction groups. Uh, this is time restriction at night here. So, so most of the food is consumed at the night. There's one pellet you can see that's being eaten in the daytime. The reason that happens is our feeder leaves one pellet uh, there. And in the case of TR night mice, they're generally sated. They eat as much as they want. So they typically don't eat that pellet until almost the next night. That tells me that they're, they really have eaten. You know, they're shared, they're sated. Uh, the TR day group here you can see is eating in the daytime, uh, but it takes that last pellet shortly after night starts, as if they're st maybe still hungry. The other funny thing that we realized later is important is they have a almost bimodal pattern. They're eating here at the end of the night or the beginning of the day, in the beginning of the night, as if they're trying to be nocturnal or stay nocturnal when we give them this 12-hour access. So they're always outsmarting us. <clears throat> um, so here's the surprise. Under caloric restriction, um, as the mice get restricted, they begin eating the food as soon as we give it to them. And in our condition, we introduce a 10-minute delay between each pellet, because the pellet's pretty big, 300 milligrams. Okay? Uh, there were a few mice that if we had, didn't have a delay, they would just take the pellet, not eat it. So, but if we make them wait 10 minutes, then they eat the pellet. And so these mice get 11 pellets a day, and it takes them 110 minutes to get those 11 pellets. Okay. And what happens is uh, once they're calorically restricted, you can see they're eating all the food within two hours, okay. both night and day. Um, the other surprise to us was that the night feeding actually disrupted the activity rhythm. Like this mouse is running in six hours early on this day, but it, it's transient and then goes away. But the important thing is that, no, so go back, is that mice on caloric restriction are uh, behaviorally time restricting themselves because they go into a two hour feeding. 22 hour fast. So they're on extreme time restriction, not just a little time restriction. Okay. And so we think that this could contribute to the benefits of caloric restriction, because if the mouse is on caloric restriction and it time restricts itself, then maybe some of the benefits from time, not just reduction in calories. That's really the question for us. Okay. So here's, here's uh, just showing you the ad-lib mice eat 14 pellets a day. The TR night group can eat, eats the same amount. The TR day group eats less. 
So they're also calorically restricted voluntarily. And then the two calorically restricted groups are eating just the 11 pellets we give them. And even in the calorically restricted group, we can see this interesting day-night metabolic difference where the night-fed mice gain less weight than the day-fed mice. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm not going to bother with you with our failed experiment. We did a longevity experiment where we tried to restrict time to six hours day and night because that's more conventional in our field. Uh, the experiment was running okay, but after one year, those mice voluntarily calorically restricted themselves, meaning they didn't eat 14 pellets a day anymore. They only eat 12 pellets a day. And so that totally blew our experiment because now we can't discriminate between time and calories. So after 18 months, we had to shut down that experiment and start over. <coughs> okay, so then this, this is our uh, current experiment. So we went back to the 12-hour time restriction. So here's ad lib, the 12-hour night and day that you saw before. And then the caloric restriction, night and day, which we call two-hour because they eat it in two hours. But then we added three more groups. So we add, added a calorically, calorically restricted group that has the food spread out for 12 hours. So the pattern is similar to the TR groups. And importantly, the fasting interval is the same because some people think fasting is what's important. <coughs> and then we added this fifth group, which has no day-night difference, where it's spread across all 24 hours. Okay? And so these are the actograms. They're a little hard to see because they're small, but um, I think you might be able to see the pink stripes in the spread group here, night or day. Uh, so they eat exactly in the pattern we give them or allow them. And then here's the 24-hour spread where you see the stripes across the whole cycle. Uh, and interestingly, when they're fed in this way in the daytime, this tends to disrupt their activity more. They tend to have more inappropriate daytime activity, these two groups, okay? All right, so we did gene expression. I'm not going to go into any detail on this, uh, except to say that the nighttime fed groups have the same phase as the adlib group, as you'd expect. And when you feed in the daytime, it shifts the phase. But in this case, only about a four-hour advance, and that's because we think those mice were fooling us and eating in a bimodal pattern. Um, but if you look at, say, just the ad lib group, young versus old, and this young means six months of age versus 18 months of age. So they're old but not decrepit at 18 months. Okay. Nice. Um, we see a huge reduction in the number of cycling genes. It goes from 3,000 at six months of age to 1,000 at 18 months. Um, and they're in the genes that are cycling both conditions, there's a significant decrease in amplitude. Okay. The amplitude is much lower in the aged mice than in the young mice. And here are just a few examples where the pink is the older mice and the gray are the younger mice. Okay. So uh, what about survival so in this experiment? So we're over two years into this experiment. These are the body weights. This is the ad lib group in gray, the two time restriction groups here. And then the five calorically restricted groups are down here. They hardly gain any weight. Uh, all the weight gain is uh, fat, shown by uh, MRI analysis, shown here. And this is the food intake. And then this is the activity level, uh, which is gradually declining with age. And so here's the, here's the critical experiment. The ad lib of mice have almost all died. Uh, and we can calculate their median lifespan here as close to 800 days, 791 days in this group, which is exactly what a black six mouse normally uh, lives. And then you can see all the other groups are living longer. The time restricted groups, and then the calorically restricted groups are doing even better. 
Uh, you can even see a trend here where the ones that are fed at night are surviving better than the corresponding group fed in the daytime. So we, it looks like CR two hour at night has the best survival so far okay. uh, compared to day. And same for the 12 hour spread. Uh, and those are better than the 24 hour spread. I think we're going to see a day-night improvement both in caloric restriction, but the important thing is in the time-restricted night group that eat the same amount of food as the athlete mice, they're living 15% longer. And so this experiment finally uh, has been able to show that there is a benefit of time restriction by itself without a reduction in calories. And we think this is uh, super important because uh, this, this has um, much easier translation to humans. For us, it's much easier for us to restrict when we eat than how much we eat. Uh, but of course, if you want to be more extreme, both caloric restriction and time restriction is going to be even more better. We would say all those groups are time restricted also, as we show. Okay. So part of that benefit is coming from a combination of caloric restriction and time restriction, except for that 24 hour spread group. Okay. So um, I'm going to stop there. I think we have a few minutes for discussion. And I tried to mention people's names along the way, but the ones in yellow in particular uh, should be to what I talked about today, especially. Nobu Koike did the chip seek work initially. No Hans Parker did all that fall to chip seek work. And then Carla Green and Vicky Acosta Rodriguez, who uh, did all of the aging and longevity work that I showed. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. That's like circadian biology in an hour. <laughs> I have one quick question, and then I have others have questions too. Does any of the mouse feeding work translate into cell culture? Should we be culturing cells and doing something to them for two to four hours a day and then changing their environment? Would that either, well, I guess the, the bottom line is, would that prevent spontaneous program cell death, which is what happens in stem cell cultures especially? Uh -huh. No, that's a really interesting question. We hadn't, you know, actually thought about trying to do that because it's actually a lot of work for cell culture to change the meat all the time, cell and all like that. We well, have to build a robot. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we might do it a chamber. You could do it then. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one thing that's always um, bothered me is uh, DMEM has really high glucose, yeah. way higher than physiological. Right. And I've always wondered why is that? And it's not that it's necessary because all the other uh, culture and media, you know, have more reasonable levels of yeah, glucose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but maybe that could make a difference. Yeah. It's also a related question, somewhat related. So when you have cultured, cultured fibroblasts, livers or what have you, and you take them out of the embryo, I guess, of the animal that I guess they're synchronized, do they stay, stay synchronized when they grow? So is there a sort of non-autonomous effect of cells, or do they become totally unsynchronized? Yeah, very good question. So in the liver, in the explants that we culture for a very long time, say 20 days, they do stay synchronized. But they don't divide? The liver, no, they're not divided. Okay, right. talking about divisional. That's right. In fibroblasts, they are not strongly coupled, and they tend to desynchronize, and I didn't show any of our evidence for that, but that, the, the range of periodicity at the single cell level in a fibroblast goes from, say, 22 hours to almost 30, the huge range, much broader than the behavior of the mouse. But the, the periodicity is precise, so a short period cell stays short. It's not like jumping around, it's like it's random, okay? Uh, and so what we've shown is that um, period is uh, heritable in cell culture, stable for more than 20 categories, that's as long as we follow it. Uh, and so you can make single cell clones from this parent culture and find short period clones and long period clones. But then when you do 
single cell imaging, you see that they're still spread. Uh, and the bottom line from, for all those experiments is that about 50% of the variance in purity is heritable. And 50% is stochastic, we think from transcriptional noise. Um, and the heritable component is not due to somatic mutation. We sequence the clonal lines. And there are no coding mutations that can explain that. But we see huge differences in gene expression at the RNA level. Um, hundreds to thousands of genes are correlated with these purity differences. Um, and we think that those gene expression differences are actually driven by DNA methylation see perfect correlation between the methylation status of those genes uh, and the period. Is this coupled to the cell cycle? It, it is, but in a complicated way. The two, yeah, the, the clock can influence the cell cycle, and the cell cycle influences the clock, depending on whose lab you uh, <laughs> <laughs> believe. <laughs> it goes in both ways. So, for example, we one uh, is regulated by clock D now. Yeah. Right. Um, what, what, but what I understood is that if you take a primary culture fibroblasts and you just culture them in standard ways that we culture them, after about two or three weeks, the periodicity of the, all the circadian genes is pretty flat, right? Like the cell, like the cell yes. cultures that we find. So the interesting thing about this, Rudolph, I thought was. You know how purists years ago when you were deriving a line of stem cells and you wanted your mouse fibroblast to only be two or three weeks old? That's about the time they stop cycling. All right? And so if you wanted, if there, I don't think anybody does that anymore, but for a while that was a deal. You had to derive a new mouse embryonic fibroblast to support your stem cell line every month. And it correlated totally with exactly when these the oscillations kind of flatten off in culture. They get random, but they actually get silent, I think, right? Are you talking about the circadian cycle or the cell cycle? No, we're talking about the circadian cycle. Okay. Because like this, the cell lines that we have in our microarray, the, the uh, clock and female and um, cry are off. I mean, they're just essentially silent. Hmm. Clock isn't silent, but period and cry are pretty, pretty low. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing to distinguish is that the clock in these fibroblasts don't stop cycling, they just get desynchronized between the individual cells. So when you measure the population, they look yeah. flat, but the but there's the individual cells are still cycling robustly forever, really. Yeah, but anyway, embryonic stem cells, at least in mice, have no rhythm. Right. And so you have to differentiate them and then they'll acquire okay. the rhythm and then you reprogram them. We think that's largely driven by MIC overexpression, which competes with the clock female uh, activation. Yeah, John? John, inspiring talk as usual. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. First, I'm, I'm wondering, um, uh, do, do you think you would see the same effect if you had this uh, time restriction for, let's say, half the week or uh, you know, every other day? Um, and I, I'm also wondering if you think there might be some kind of you know, critical period to it. You know, does it, does it, does it, it you know, does the animal need to be on this for, forever? As I mean, obviously that's this first experiment or experiments. So mm -hmm. yeah. So um, pandas actually done a five-two protocol where they're on time restriction for five days and they're off for two, and that still protects them. So you go to that extent, but I don't think you can go beyond that. Um, there are all these crazy fad diets, you know. Where what, why do you, you think it works? Uh, which? The, why do you think the time restriction works? Uh, yeah, we'd like to, I'd like to, you know, know the answer to that. Do you think it's going to be like related to proteostasis or? or, or, <coughs> or, or well, you know, the entire, just if you look at the liver, the entire liver is programmed deal with nutrients in a time-dependent manner, both um, metabolizing them, but also detoxifying everything we eat, too. So there are lots of things going on uh, every day when we consume foods, uh, both positive and negative. And so I think that 
when they're consumed at the optimal time, everything has been programmed to deal with those in, in the best way. You know, metabolizing them without uh, producing too much redox uh, and other things like that. So I think it's, it's really a fine balance of many, many aspects of metabolism that are going on. We have time for one more show whether these results can be extrapolated to human. And you don't think it's G? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great point. We, we, of course, haven't done any work on that. But I think uh, I've seen a few little papers emerging on this. So I think there, there are going to be people studying that. Quick question, Dave. Slightly related to that. You're looking at nocturnal models. So what's the difference between a non-nocturnal and a nocturnal animal model? In these, because you you know you're sort of looking more of a species that's actually developed to live more of the night time. That's correct. So yeah, so for us, we would flip when we're supposed to eat. We're, we should be eating when we're awake, which is the daytime. Uh, that that would be the optimal time. Um, now, caloric restriction has been done in non-human primates. You know, both Wisconsin and NIA. There was a controversy about whether it extended lifespan, but I think they settled and agreed upon uh, the fact that it does extend lifespan in non-human primates. But when I looked at those papers, it turns out both studies time restrict their feeding. <laughs> Especially at the NIH, they get the food at 8 a.m., they take it on at 3 p.m. So it's a pretty severe time restriction. And that, I think, also might have compromised their control group and made them live longer, which, which made the effect size small for them. Um, but both of those are, are clearly on time restriction. I want us to kind of stay on schedule, so we're going to go have our coffee break and uh, let 